Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, what I'm going to do is count down 10 productivity tools for your Linux desktop. And the key word here is desktop because I'm going to be focusing on desktop apps through the majority of this video, although a few command line apps have made the list. Now, most of these apps are applications that I use personally. So some of these, I just can't wait to show you because they really enhanced my productivity quite a bit. And there's all kinds of things on this list from virtualization to syncing utilities, a backup utility. It's going to be a lot of fun. Anyway, I can't wait to get into the list. So let's do that right now. First, Todoist. Todoist is a to-do app and is something I use extensively. Its functionality is fairly straightforward. You simply add a task that you need to do and then check it complete when you're finished. Each task can have its own tags, deadlines, and you can even type a description. However, Todoist doesn't stop there. You could also split your to-dos into multiple projects, so that way you could break down large projects into smaller tasks. In addition to that, you can also set up Kanban boards, which is actually how I keep track of the videos that I'm working on for this channel. Another great thing about this app is that it's cross-platform, so you could use it on just about everything. Windows, macOS, smartphones, and of course, Linux. And since your account syncs between devices, you could use Todoist as your central place for keeping track of what you need to do. The downside of Todoist, though, is that it's not free. Well, there is a free account, but it's a bit limited. If you want additional features, they'll charge you 4 or $6 a month for those additional features. So that's just something you'll have to take a look at. You can look at the product matrix and find out if one of the paid plans is going to be right for you. But otherwise, just stick to the free account. On my end, this is one of my favorite apps on the list, and I can't imagine working without it. And sure, it's a simple to-do app. There's really not that much to say, but there's a lot of features. The UI is very easy to use, and it's very stable. I haven't had any sync issues or anything like that. And, well, I use it for everything, not just work. I use it for my grocery list, my video game queue, my rating queue, you name it. It's a great app. Next up, Standard Notes. Standard Notes is a note-taking app similar to other apps like Joplin and Obsidian. You could think of Standard Notes like a large notebook, and you could use tags to separate notes into different categories. It's also full of neat features. For example, when you create a new note, there are several different formats you could choose between, including Markdown. You could also add plugins to Standard Notes to increase its functionality, although on my end, I just use it as is without any plugins at all. For me, Standard Notes is a very important tool, and I use it every day. In fact, it's the tool I use to write scripts for every video on this channel since I've discovered it. I'm not going to say that it has any features that will blow you away. I mean, it's a note-taking app. It's not going to change your life or anything like that. But for me, it has all the functionality that I need. It's stable, and it just works. And just like Todoist, Standard Notes is cross-platform. It's not a Linux-specific app by any means, but there's a Linux version available for those of you within my audience, but there's also versions available for Windows and Mac OS as well. In fact, you can even use it on your phone, and it syncs your notes between devices, so it could be your one note-taking app for all note-taking purposes. Next up, KDE Connect. KDE Connect is part of the Plasma desktop and is something of a killer feature for some of you out there. A lot of people really, really love KDE Connect. What it allows you to do is manage your smartphone from your Linux desktop. You can see notifications, query your battery level, transfer files, share your clipboard, and more. You could even use it for multimedia controls. For those of you that desire functionality like this, it's highly recommended. Best of all, it's free. It's part of the Plasma desktop, with some distributions even going as far as to include it by default. So if managing your smartphone from your Plasma desktop sounds good to you, then I recommend that you give it a shot. The thing is, though, this app isn't something that I find useful personally. On my end, I hate smartphones, and I think they're a nuisance. Every five minutes, there's a notification popping up on my phone screen, so I consider smartphones to be interruption devices, and they annoy me. For that reason, I don't like to have phone notifications on my computer, but that said, even though I don't personally use this application, I'm sure most of you would find this functionality useful. If you wanted to access information on your phone directly from your computer, then it's a great solution for that. If you use a Plasma desktop, you should consider checking out KDE Connect. 
Continuing, let's talk about backup software, specifically TimeShift. TimeShift is a utility you could use to snapshot your Linux file system as well as take backups. There's two different methods for backing up. There's an rsync method and also support for ButterFS. If your Linux distro uses ButterFS, you can integrate its features within TimeShift. For example, it can grab your home volume directly from the subvolume. But even if you don't use ButterFS, you can still fall back on the rsync method, which will support any other distribution. With TimeShift, you could perform full and incremental backups, making it a solution you could continually use to snapshot your system. You could also schedule backups so that they automatically happen, and it's a great tool not only for taking snapshots, but also for recovering deleted files as well. TimeShift itself is part of the XApp project, which is under the guidance of Linux Mint. That also means that TimeShift is pre-installed within Linux Mint, so if that's your distro of choice, then you already have TimeShift available. If not, you can easily install it on other distributions as well. Either way, if you're looking for a great backup and snapshot system for your Linux desktop, then definitely check out TimeShift. For my next pick, here's an awesome utility for keeping track of passwords. Sure, we all universally hate passwords, just like we hate printers and DNS, but passwords will be around for at least a little while longer, so having an application to help organize these is important. For this use case, I highly recommend Bitwarden. Bitwarden is a tool that you could download or host yourself that's a full password manager. Your password database will sync between computers, it's encrypted, that's pretty important, and there's Bitwarden clients available for just about everything. In addition, you could install the plugin within most popular web browsers, so that way you could have it autofill your credentials. In addition to that, Bitwarden also features a password generator, and it could even keep track of time-based one-time passwords as well. An honorable mention here is KeePassXC for those of you that prefer something that's not run by a company. I've never had a problem with Bitwarden, but I understand that some of you prefer to go your own direction. KeePassXC is also a great app for the same purpose, which makes it a runner-up in this category. It doesn't have as many built-in features when compared to Bitwarden, and the syncing process of KeePassXC is a bit more manual. For that reason, Bitwarden won out for inclusion on this list, but KeePassXC, well, that's worth checking out too. Sorry to interrupt my own video, but I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate each and every single one of you and I love creating Linux related content for you guys. But unfortunately, producing high quality Linux content like this isn't cheap. But if you want to help me make even more content for you guys, then consider supporting Learn Linux TV. And a great way to do that is to check out the official shop for Learn Linux TV, which was just recently updated. Inside the shop, you'll find distro themed shirts, bags, drinkware, and more. And there's some other surprises there as well. For example, I've just introduced a mouse pad that doubles as a Tmux cheat sheet. How cool is that? So check out the shop at merch.learnlinux.tv or you can check out the merch shelf right here on YouTube. You could get yourself something really cool and support Linux learning at the same time. So it's a win-win. Anyway, thank you guys so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Now let's get back to the video. Next up, Vim. I decided not to focus on terminal apps in this video, but Vim is one of two that I couldn't resist mentioning. At a surface, Vim is a text editor, but it contains so many features that it's nearly impossible to learn them all. When it comes to a standard text editor, Vim might seem like feature overkill to some. If someone just wants to edit files using a simpler editor, Nano and Micro are good choices. But there's so much that you could do in Vim to the point where when you learn it, it could pretty much be an IDE of its own since you can install plugins to help with writing code, among other things. In addition to that, if you're a writer, there's plugins for that too. The downside of Vim is that its operation isn't exactly similar to other editors. You have to learn Vim's way of doing things, such as switching between insert and command modes depending on what you want to do. But once you get past the unusual workflow of Vim, you might find that you actually prefer it. That's the case on my end. But if you find it hard to learn, I have a course right here on YouTube that will teach you everything you need to know to use it. So if you want to check that out, then you could be up and running in no time. Continuing, I wanted to also mention SyncThing. SyncThing is an app you can run on just about any device that helps you keep your files in sync. On my end, I use SyncThing daily and I can't imagine using my computers without it. What SyncThing does is keep folders on multiple devices in sync. For example, let's say you have a documents directory on both your desktop and your laptop. If you add your documents directory as a synced folder within SyncThing, then any computer that also has SyncThing installed will also be syncing that same folder and keeping it up to date. 
This way, you don't have to worry about which device you saved a file on because once you save something, every computer will have that same file. It's a full syncing solution. One of the best things about SyncThing is that it's super stable and you could really depend on it. I've had no issues with it whatsoever. In fact, it runs so well sometimes that I completely forget about it for weeks, since it doesn't show alerts or anything on my screen every time it does something. I mean, sure, there is a desktop tool that you can install, but even if you don't install that tool, it's just going to run in the background and keep things in sync. If you do want to see what SyncThing is up to, there's a web console available that runs on your local machine, and it's how you'll configure it and check its status. By default, SyncThing will create a sync folder, but you don't have to use it. You can add your own folders to SyncThing pretty easily, and it's a great app overall. On my end, I use it to sync all the video footage that I use for this channel, and considering my media production folder can have hundreds of gigabytes inside it at any given time, the fact that SyncThing is able to keep up with such a large volume is pretty good. The only downside is that it's a bit cumbersome to set up, but thankfully I have a tutorial on my channel that'll teach you how to use it. That tutorial is a bit dated by today's standards, it's an older video, but SyncThing hasn't changed all that much over the years, so you should still be able to follow that tutorial to get yourself up and running. Next up, GNOME Boxes. GNOME Boxes is a virtualization solution that enables you to easily spin up virtual machines on your Linux desktop. In fact, some distributions such as Fedora have GNOME Boxes built in, which means on Fedora, you're literally able to spin up virtual machines right from your initial installation. Now, most distributions don't include it by default, but on the other hand, it's also very easy to install. All you should have to do is install the package, and that's about it. When it comes to setting up a virtual machine within GNOME Boxes, it's very straightforward. In some cases, it might even do everything for you automatically. It's easy to keep track of different virtual machines that you have running on your system. The interface is very simple, but it's effective, and it's highly recommended. Now, I would have mentioned VirtualBox for this pick, but sometimes licensing can be an issue with VirtualBox, especially if you're working in a company. In some cases, using it at a business can be a licensing violation. I'm not going to get into that, and people often do it anyway. I'm not advocating for that. But in my opinion, with GNOME Boxes existing, then why bother a virtual box? If GNOME Boxes serves all of your purposes and checks all your boxes, then it's a great application. And considering that it's good enough for Fedora to build it in, well, that's saying something. It's a great application. Continuing, Tailscale. Tailscale is an amazing network utility that I just can't imagine living without because it's really transformed how I connect to all of my devices. What Tailscale is, is an overlay network. So if you think of your normal network, like your Wi-Fi or your wired-in network, that's your you know standard network. Tailscale works on top of that by giving your device an additional IP address. And that means that you can then access that device from any other device that also has Tailscale installed and is logged into your account. What that means is you could have a desktop at home with Tailscale installed on it and a laptop with Tailscale installed on it. And when you leave your house, you'll still be able to access the files on your desktops. You can think of it like a VPN and it does have a VPN service in the application that you could run, but it's not completely the same thing as a VPN. It uses WireGuard, but effectively the end result is the same thing. You get a lot of control over which devices have it installed and even a dashboard that you could go to to find out what your Tailscale IP addresses are. And there's also built-in Magic DNS and all kinds of features to help make this easier for you. It's not difficult to use at any point. I will have a video on my channel if I don't already that I'll teach you everything you need to know to use it. So just keep a lookout for that video, and who knows, maybe it's already here, but either way, that video will teach you everything you need to know to get started with Tailscale. It's definitely highly recommended. Finally, Tmux. Now, I broke a little rule earlier when I mentioned Vim because that's a command line app, and I wanted to focus on desktop apps, but Tmux is one of those things that I think really should be on this list because what it does is it gives you additional features inside your Linux terminal. It's a terminal multiplexer. I won't get into what that means. It's a bit out of scope. But essentially what it lets you do is configure your Linux terminals in ways that you couldn't do that before. For example, you can open tabs, you can split windows. And sure, some terminal emulators have those features built in, so you don't really need Tmux for this functionality. 
But the beauty of Tmux is that it runs without a desktop at all. If you're just using the command line, so you don't have any GUI apps at all in your full command line, you could use Tmux to have many of the same features that graphical terminal emulators would have. For example, opening a tab in a terminal emulator, that's often something that you can do. But even if your terminal does not support tabs, you can still get that functionality with Tmux, which also means you could choose a lightweight terminal and then have Tmux handle most of the features. You could do things like set a vertical split, a horizontal split, different tabs, and you could even send the same input to multiple terminals or multiple servers at the same time. So imagine if you needed to do the same thing on 10 different servers simultaneously, not a very common thing that you'll need to do, but if it does happen, you can send the same command to every Linux server at the same time. So that gives you a lot of flexibility. Another great feature of Tmux is that it keeps everything running. So for example, let's say you're installing a package on your Linux server and you're doing this remotely and then your connection drops. Maybe your ISP is having an issue. Now that would be a very bad thing to have your connection drop in the middle of installing a package. I mean, you could have a half installed application at that point. Definitely not something that we want to run into. But the thing is, if you are running Tmux, then your session will stay running even if your connection drops. So if you have a network hiccup or something like that, you can simply reconnect to your Tmux session and everything will be there right as you left it. If you had a process running, it'll still be running. It'll still make progress even when you're not attached to it because it keeps everything running in a Tmux session that doesn't really depend on you having a connection because you can easily get that back. As always, I do have a full tutorial series that covers Tmux if you want to use it. That'll teach you everything you need to know. And I highly recommend it because Tmux is awesome. And there's our video. I really hope you enjoyed my list of 10 productivity tools for your Linux desktop. And if you did enjoy it, then click that like button to let YouTube know. Who knows? If you do that, we might see more Linux related content here on YouTube. And I would really appreciate that. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this video as well. And also, if there was an application that you think should have been on the list, well, let me know. You never know. I might make a sequel to this video. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next one.